Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. You might be wondering why a professor of public policy is here speaking to you now. Uh, DJ may have made the case better than I can, but the way I would say it is that the work you all are doing allowing big data analytics is having a fundamental impact on how society governs itself today. Throughout human history, whether we look at the first written law in the form of Hammurabi's code, whether we look at the Enlightenment and the realization that maybe individuals are created equally, or the design and implementation of the International Court of Justice, innovations in the technology of governance have transformed our ability over and over to design and deploy equitable and efficient government policies and making the world a better place each time. We are now in the midst of yet another revolution as the confluence of computing, data collection, and data analytics are allowing us to better understand ourselves and how we react to both policies and changes around us. And that helps us design better policies every day now. I'm going to bring, show you an example from my own work where we're trying to think about the global climate and how we ought to manage it. For the last several millennia, societies around the world have struggled to cope with climatic changes. What I'm showing you here is a timeline of regions around the world, and each gray bar represents a period in which societies or civilizations faced periods of upheaval, or in some cases, collapse. And the black lines are sort of time series of different types of climatic measures, how hot or dry things were. And what we see is over and over again, societies have struggled and in many cases failed to handle these challenges effectively. Today, we are now at sort of a yet another juncture of the same variety, except the rules have changed slightly because we're the ones actually causing the climate to change. But unlike those previous societies, we have the data and analytics to really understand what is happening and to, to conquer this challenge uh, of a generation intelligently and effectively while rationally managing this transition. The thing that I call the fundamental climate management problem is really trying to determine whether the benefits of adopting a, a low emissions and low climate change scenario outweigh the costs of altering the global energy system necessary to achieve that scenario. Now, that's a hard problem, and to try and get at that, the approach I've taken is to sort of deploy econometric techniques that help us understand how society has historically responded to changes in the environment. And by doing so, we better get a sense of what changes in the future might mean for us. So for example, we can think of typhoons and hurricanes. These are large-scale environmental events whose distribution and frequency is expected to change in the future under climate change. But we don't know what their economic costs might be. So to get a handle on this, what we've done is we've reconstructed the exposure of individuals on the ground as historical hurricanes and typhoons pass over them. And we've repeated this for all 6,000 hurricanes that have been observed on planet Earth since 1950. And when we merge this data, this very rich data, with all sorts of human-level data, we see that there are really striking impacts of the environment on these individuals. So for example, if we go to the Philippines, what I'm showing you here are surveys from individual households, and we find that the probability households actually have strong walls to their home decreases, or the probability they're conspicuously missing increases, conditional on the intensity of the typhoon they might have experienced in the prior year. So that makes us think that they lost their walls in the prior year due to the storm, and if we repeat the exercise, we actually see that it's true for a variety of different types of durable assets, things like having a refrigerator or television. Interestingly, the probability that households are missing cars are unaffected, but that kind of makes sense, because as you hear a storm is coming, you can move your car to safety. These economic impacts have real, real welfare implications. On the right, you see that spending at the household level on things like meat and other types of nutritious food uh, are reduced conditional on the intensity of the storm. Now, how do these results scale up around the world? Well, we can think about what the macroeconomic response looks like. And if you were to open up any sort of World Bank or United Nations report, you'd see a graph like this, where people hypothesize maybe countries grow better and faster because of creative destruction after disasters, or maybe they never recover. We haven't known until now what the answer is. We've applied our reconstruction of 6,000 storms, trying to deconvolve the effect, the impulse response function of hurricanes on national economies, and we actually see that in the real world, 20 years after a hurricane, we can still see the signal 
in the macro economy. And this has profound implications for how we think about global climate change because it means that there is a $10 trillion cost that we haven't even been considering yet. Changing gears for a sec, we can also ask what happens when the entire global climate changes instead of these localized events. And to do that, we look at things we call the El Nino Southern Oscillation, where the tropical Pacific flip-flops and changes the global climate. So during an El Nino, what happens is in the equatorial West Pacific, a huge amount of thermal energy is released into the atmosphere. And then it propagates around the equator in, some, in the form of an equatorial Kelvin wave, leading to heating and drying throughout the tropics, but largely missing the higher latitudes. What we do is we sort of reconstruct these events, and that allows us to tag those locations on the ground that are getting hit by this large atmospheric wave and having their climate change dramatically. And then we think of the blue locations as people who are being largely missed by these events. Okay? So they're like the placebo or control group. And then what we see is if we look at evidence of political instability, so in this case, we look at the probability that a randomly selected country in that red region experiences a new civil conflict, we find that the probability of violence actually doubles as you shift from the cooler and wetter La Nina state to the hotter and drier El Nino state. And if you were to look at those populations that are too far north or too far south to actually be affected by that event, we see that their probability of violence remains unchanged throughout the data. Now, you might think that this is just sort of a spurious relationship because we don't have too many years of historical data. So what I'm showing you here is the region I was just looking at as well as the relationship between what's happening in the Pacific and what's happening around the world. But what we've done now is we've looked at a variety of different data sets at a variety of different scales. So for example, you can look at countries within Africa, you can look within pixels of Eastern Africa, or you can look even within a pixel at individual Tanzanian villages. And what we find is that all different scales of, of human organization, we see very similar responses, where shifts towards higher temperatures or drier conditions are associated with higher rates of various forms of both interpersonal and intergroup conflict and violence. And this has real-world implications and is something we are considering when we think about climate policy. Now, if you're cynical, and you didn't just hear DJ's talk, you might think that these types of studies have no effect on the real world. But our ability to provide real-world evidence is increasing the public's awareness of these issues and their interest in them, which then translates into the government also being interested and aware of them. So, for example, for the first time during the State of the Union, the president explicitly said that based on evidence, we know that climate change might increase the risk of conflict and instability around the world. And it's not just rhetoric, it actually translates into action. So what we saw just recently is that when the president released his new budget, there was for the first time an entire section detailing the economic risks posed to the national economy by climate change. And it explicitly cites studies just like this. So I say to you, we are now entering a new era where data, evidence, and analytics are not just moving the dial, but they're playing a central role in the way in which we govern ourselves. Thank you very much.